Welcome to the Bioinformatics Zero podcast. My name is Grace Ratley, and I'll be your host for today's show. And today I'm joined by Alex Shalik, who is a faculty member at MIT, the Reagan Institute, and the Broad Institute. Welcome. Thanks so much for having me, Grace. Yeah, it's great to have you on. So your research is incredibly multidisciplinary. It spans fields such as microbiota research, cancer, immunology, nanotechnology, engineering, and genomics. Can you tell us a little bit about how you tie these fields together? Oh, it's a it's a complicated question. I think that you know we've ended up spanning a number of different disciplines just because it's necessary for the kinds of questions that we want to ask. You know, if you asked me when I was an 18 year old if I would be a faculty member studying the things I'm studying now, um, I would have thought you were crazy. Um, in college, you know, I focused on chemistry, physics, and math, and actually originally went to graduate school to do some theory work. And due to a series of different events, ended up doing nanobiotechnology, which got me into immunology and then into systems biology, and then very concerned and confused by sort of heterogeneity among cells, which took me down this rabbit hole. And you know, what it really taught me at the end of the day was that I had to be very careful when I was looking at the system to make sure that I understood all of the components or to measure as many of the components as I could. You know, I didn't necessarily have the background to assume what was the most important factor. And so I just got very interested in how could we comprehensively profile as many things as was possible, understand how they might be working together in synergy, just so that you know there weren't really those blank spaces in the microscope that could be incredibly important that we were just missing. And so you know, you start studying, for example, the gut, and all of a sudden, you know, there's this incredible amount of diversity among the microbiota that's in your gut. And so it's this big missing piece. And so you have to look at it in combination with some of the cells that you want to look at. And then, you know, even just thinking about the gut, it's you know, one uh, part of your body that interacts with many other parts of your body. And so when you start to think about the assumptions that we make when we focus on any specific thing. It just, you know, made me uncomfortable. It was one of those things where as we started trying to be more comprehensive, we naturally had to bring in principles from lots of different places. And you know, one of the fantastic things about being in Boston is just sort of the strength of this collaborative ecosystem where you could work with partners in genomics at the Broad, immunology at the Reagan, you know, all the different engineering disciplines at MIT, you know, some incredible teams over the hospitals across the river. And we just tried to take advantage of that, you know, working in these collaborative networks to do things that would be hard to do in other contexts. You know, I constantly get reminded of how little I know, but it's also um, incredibly exciting because you're learning new things every day and seeing things in the intersection that you might have missed otherwise. Going from theory to where you are now is, I mean, those are those are two very opposite things because, I mean, theory is pretty hands-off and now you're all applications and hands-on, but, but still trying to understand the bigger picture. It's really amazing how you've brought those two things together. It's funny, I've ended up sort of in a similar place when I was going to graduate school. I'd really like the idea of theory because I was told that if I had an internet connection, I could work anywhere in the world as long as I could send along my research and make progress during my PhD. And then, you know, in the work that we've done, it's become increasingly global, collaborating with people, you know, on six different continents and multiple different countries. And so the travel has become a big part of what we do, as has the international collaboration. But it's very different than I originally envisioned, you know, sort of this remote science being. Yeah, certainly. And we have the bioinformatics here. We're very familiar with remote science. And then kind of back on your research, like this concept of understanding all of the tiny pieces of the system really ties in with your research associated with single cell sequencing. Can you tell us a little bit about the developments you've made in single cell sequencing? Yeah, of course. Happy to. You know, we've just been a part of this. I think that there's been this incredible effort among the community to develop a number of the different technologies that have now become standard in sort of applying genomics to single cells. I happened to be at a very, you know, fortunate place and it was sort of, you know, it was a moment of one of those things that serendipity. I wouldn't say it's purely fortunate because you have to recognize the opportunity, but on the other hand, it was definitely in the right place at the right time. You know, for me, through some of the technologies I developed with others in Huntington Park's lab in graduate school, started doing some immunology and and we were doing these genomic assays and they were really cool, you know, because now you could look at all of the genes. So I didn't have to pick one or two that I thought were really important. Um, but as you know very well, whenever you're doing genomics, you do these sort of guilt by association analyses and you sort of use correlations and you infer what networks are. And really what you have to do after that is you have to go back and systematically test your predictions through different perturbations. And unfortunately, you know, when I started doing these perturbations with others, to try and understand whether the predictions we were making were in fact correct. I just see that like 
every single cell I was looking at looked a little different. They would express different levels of RNAs I thought were important, or you know, the protein abundance would be different, or it would be localized differently. Red cells just wouldn't look quite the same, or we'd be trying to kill all of the cancer, and we would find that we could only kill some of the cells. So there was just this heterogeneity that I didn't understand, and sort of where I was coming from, and sort of that chemistry, physics, and math background. You know, I had this idea that you know, if you put one input, like one drug on one system, it should give you one output. And so, you know, when you see that you're getting this variety of different responses, it was really unsettling. And so in some of the work that I did in my postdoc, you know, with a number of others around the broad community, it's sort of this large collaborative project, I got very interested in trying to figure out whether or not there was any information in this variation. You know, we could assume that all the cells are the same, or, you know, just like scientists, you know, they're all scientists, but they all are very different. And, you know, if you just time to get to know any, every one of them, you might begin to understand a little bit more about the subspecializations and the things that go in their training and the like. So did what, you know, at the time was a relatively insane postdoc trying to sequence individual cells, trying to just see if, you know, what you could measure was actually biological. And then even above and beyond that, if there was any information in it, because uh, you could have imagined it was just all noise due to sort of the stochasticity of gene expression. Long story short, you know, we profiled some cells and we started looking at sort of variation. And what we found was there was actually a lot of structure in gene expression co-variation. You know, what that told us was that maybe there was some biological signals that we could pull out of this very complex data. And, you know, we went on to show that some of this derives from differences in cell states and that derives from differences in cell circuits. Sometimes you have differences in cellular processes. Um, and when I think back on it, it's, it's not as surprising as you might think, because what we're really saying is that different cell types have different accessible regions of DNA and different proteins. And so they're going to produce different transcripts and it's going to look like these major differences. But at the time, you know, the idea of sequencing like 0.1 picograms of RNA just seemed uh, relatively nuts, for lack of a better way of saying it. Um, and once, you know, it turned out that there was going to be sort of this this hidden, you know, trove of treasures and looking at, at single cells in the same way you might think about like looking at people in the, you know, in any country and then Rather than just looking at like the average, they have 1.8 children or, you know, they have a median income of 50,000, like looking at each individual one associating variables, we're like, wow, there might be something really transformative we could do here. And so even though we started off with a really small number, we always were like, oh, well, we're probably going to have to hit these huge numbers and, you know, really get power. We've got trillions of cells in our body. How are we going to start doing the science that we want to really understand what's happening there to understand what's happening in different bodies, to understand what's happening in different diseases. And so from this initial demonstration, you know, that we did with a number of people around the Bro community, it sort of spurred us into this sort of charge to try and develop technologies that would help us scale, you know, partnering with people originally on the West Coast, out of fluidine, trying to use microfluidics, and then trying to develop things that worked on droplets here in Boston with you know a number of with a number of people across different institutions and different backgrounds. You know, ranging from computationalists to, you know, incredible experimentalists. It was just this, this group of people coming together to try and figure out how we could do more. And then from there, you know, I got really interested in some of the stuff we were doing in our work over at the Reagan in how we could make these things more translationally oriented. I really like some of the basic biology, but my home department at MIT, you know, I'm sort of joint appointed between the Institute for Medical Engineering and Science and the Department of Chemistry with affiliation of the COPE. But you know, IMS really is sort of that bridge department between Harvard Medical School and MIT. So there's really this biomedical engineering approach facing out into the community, trying to think about medical problems. And, you know, through my connection with the Reagan, where we were focusing on infectious diseases, I kept on thinking, you know, these tools are really powerful, but they're not addressing real world problems. They're not, you know, having a major impact on human health. So with one of my good friends and colleagues, Chris Lovo Coke, we tried to simplify some of the technologies to make them easier to use, limit the number of peripherals, make them simplified. And it turned out that, you know, that was broadly enabling. And so we started uh, teaching others how to do it. And all of a sudden, you know, we were engaged in partnerships all around the world, trying to apply these same technologies to address problems that are of global significance, but very often don't get the same research time, either because they're not problems here in the United States or because, you know, practical parts associated with actually studying them is just daunting. Like the idea of doing a study of Ebola, which we recently did with a couple of people uh, down at Fort Detrick, like the idea of doing genomics on a BSL-4 pathogen in a in vivo infection, like it was just really hard to figure out how you would make that all come together. 
But given this community, as challenges arose, we just had the opportunity to sort of pull from all of these incredible scientists that were around us and start to think about collectively how we would start to begin to tackle these things. A lot of that's been great. And, you know, it's been nice to see the entire community come and start doing similar stuff in the context of COVID. I mean, if there's any silver lining to what's happening right now, it's that, you know, so many people are working on, you know, similar problems, bringing together different um, vantage points and different trainings to really try and make substantial inroads simultaneously and open sharing of data, of ideas, and hopefully it's a model for everything going forward because I feel like it's amazing what the scientific community can do when they come together as a collective to try and you know, tackle problems. Yeah, I think the research really addresses this problem of like accessibility with things like sequencing and, and how, you know, when sequencing was first available, you know, it took years to sequence and it was incredibly expensive and only like two labs could do it. And the cost of sequencing came down a lot and more studies and more publications and more research and everyone working on these problems together. And and you've really, through the development of, of Sequel, your single cell sequencing platform, you've kind of made that sort of research available to more scientists, which hopefully will, you know, enable more reproducibility within science and, and kind of the consideration of all of the cell-cell differences in systems research. So I hope it does, but, you know, it's not totally selfless. You know, what we've sort of learned from doing all this stuff is that it's important to develop tools and then to give them to people, make them accessible, and, and see what sort of the failure modes are, because that actually gives you insights into what sort of the next generation of tools are. So I've been a big believer in this idea if you find biological problems, you try and figure out how to address them, use tools that exist, but if there aren't good tools, then you go, you know, work on new tools. And then you apply the tools and you figure out, you know, what they can teach you, but also why they suck, for lack of a better way of saying it. And so, you know, I think this has sort of been a constant point in the science we've done and a number of others. And so even thinking back to, you know, some of the early three prime barcoding work that was done to make massively parallel sequencing happen in Propsy, you know, Evan McCaskill and Stephen Carroll and others did this incredible job of creating sort of, you know, resources and putting stuff out and making everything accessible to the community and, you know, having helplines. And so you know, a lot of those things we, you know, were trying to follow sort of best practices. But as we saw and heard that there were needs, it obviously pushed us to try and figure out how to make it you know, simpler and easier, to make it easier to move to a clinic, to make it easier to move to you know, another country. I think one of the things that it's not lost on me is that there's been this tremendous advance in sort of the molecular techniques that we've been able to use over the last little bit. And if we think about like sort of where we were a little bit ago and where we are now, if we think about our ability to edit and manipulate the genome and our ability to record and profile, you know, single cells. I mean, there's just been this quantum leap in what you can do, both on the measurement and perturbation scales. But on the other hand, you know, it's also created increasing inequities in the science. And that's because, as you were saying, it used to be two labs that could do these things. And now, you know, more labs can do stuff, but there really is this incredible concentration of some of these techniques in places like Boston and San Francisco and parts of the UK and others. And it doesn't mean that others can't do it. It just means that, you know, the rate at which science accelerates in some of these regions is different. And, you know, in going and working with partners in other parts of the world, you began to see how important the problems were. You know, you know, but it's not really tangible until you go visit. I remember that Bruce Walker, who is the co-director of the Reagan, took me down when I first started at MIT to Durban, South Africa, to KRIF, which is now at PARI, the Africa Health Research Institute, to sort of see what was happening in research there to go out into the community, see these places that were hit very hard by the HIV pandemic and uh, by tuberculosis, and just to see like what sample collection looks like, you know, what were the questions the scientists were trying to address locally. And it's this incredible facility. It's beautiful. It, it could be the same thing that you would have in Boston, you know, and it stands, it stands out, you know, in a lot of ways. But on the other hand, it just helped me to understand if we wanted to really deliver on the things we were writing in papers, like this is going to be a transformative technology, like what it would actually take to make it a transformative technology. Met a bunch of great people there, you know, bonded with them and started trying to figure out what does it take to really, you know, move the needle to move these technologies there to make it so that these research questions that are incredibly important that aren't getting the same attention as they should have the opportunity to really be pushed. And, you know, you might say, well, you know, why don't you just do it all in Boston? You know, I'm a big believer that you have to create local capacity and empowerment and, you know, create an entire community and get many people involved. As I said at the beginning, like I have some training in various places and I'm sort of a jack of all trades, maybe a master of none. But the idea that I was going to all of a sudden tell people that were working on HIV research that were these incredible uh, luminaries that had these years of expertise exactly what to do 
is foolish and ridiculous. And so it's really about, you know, going down there, creating partnerships, figuring what they need, going back and forth and, you know, trying to get people up and going. And so from that, that sort of spawned into a number of different partnerships all around the world. But really, I feel like these technologies, as good as they are, if we don't bring them to bear on the problems that are important, we don't make them accessible to everybody, it's really not going to put us in the position that we want to be. And I think that another thing that the pandemic has taught us is that you know, these things affect all of us. And it may be something that you, know, you previously could have said, oh, this is a remote thing that sits in some area. And maybe you read that one case happened in the United States and you know, something else. I think back to like, you know, some of the Ebola outbreaks. But I think what this pandemic has taught us is how connected and interdependent we are and how important it is to not just focus on our local problems, but to also think about the importance of solving global ones simultaneously, whether it's supply chain issues or, you know, vaccine creation issues or surveillance issues. And so excited by by a lot of what these things have done, but it keeps on pushing me to think about like, well, how do we reach more people? How do we create more capacity? How do we get more people engaged in this? And like I said, it's it's not fully selfless. It's one of those things where as people tell you, this is why the technology has a problem. This is like the computational problem that we just need to solve. It's an incredible substrate for research. I mean, there's been really cool stuff that we've done over the last little bit, you know, along with others and trying to figure out like how to use sequencing of single cells to figure out host pathogen interactions and codependencies. And you know, a lot of that stuff comes out of conversations where people are saying, well, I'd love to know, you know, how the virus is hijacking some cells. And you're like, oh, well, that's a great computational problem. Why don't we go try and uh, put a little bit of time into it? And so, I think what I'm trying to say and what I'm trying to emphasize here is that, like, yeah, this stuff is super powerful, but there's this incredible value in like networking and collaborating with the entire community, taking advantage of all of these people that think in very different ways and that um, can sort of push you to tackle problems and to address things uh, that are bigger and more important than you could have ever imagined. Yeah, and and I'd really like to talk a little bit about your five step approach to studying systems biology, like you do. Can you tell us a little bit about that? I think that my strength as a scientist, if I was trying to be critical, is it's this ability to merge together different fields and sort of see how they're going to mesh and understand particular problems and understand synergies. And I think in a lot of places, some of the ideas that I have in my head are very hard to bring across to others. And so in some places, I've tried to distill some of them down. I mean, if I really think like fundamentally about what our lab is interested in, what we're interested in is homeostasis in tissues. And so coming from chemistry and physics, like the idea of homeostasis or equilibrium is like this very basic concept that you would have been taught in you know high school and even potentially before that in like seventh grade science. Like you understand what that means. But if I ask you to sort of say, what does homeostasis mean in a tissue? Like what, what does that mean? Like what are the cells doing? What are the processes? Who depends upon whom? Like in the same way that you might think about your community, like what does it mean for it to be sort of this state of, you know, of, of dynamic flux, but also stability. It's this really hard concept. And then, you know, you might say, well, what are the things that disturb equilibrium? Well, those are the things that drive disease and how can environmental factors, whether it's, you know, an infection or a high fat diet do that. Um, and then you might ask yourself, well, how do you make a, a community more resilient? And those are things that we're sort of interested in, the questions we want to ask, but sort of the language to describe these sorts of things is very nebulous. I mean, I think there's a lot of stuff we can learn from sort of the social sciences and from what people have done in ecology, but there's this sort of approach to thinking about cellular communities that is hard to bring about. And I think, you know, sort of similarly, when I think about like how we like to approach tackling problems, it's hard to sort of explain it perfectly. And I don't like to be too reductionist, but I, I sort of was, because I recognize sort of the multitudes, but on the other hand, it sort of felt like it was easy to sort of say, well, let me think about this in sort of five pieces that map very nicely to chemistry and physics, which is like, you know, in chemistry and physics, we have this periodic table, we understand what the elements are, right? And so in biology, you know, we really need to understand what the elements are. And so we always think about like, what are the identities of the cells in our systems? And, you know, we're obviously not alone in this. There's this entire grassroots international movement led by, you know, Devin Sarah Teichman to do this human cell atlas um, that involves, you know, thousands of individuals across multiple different countries and continents. And there's a number of people that are interested in it. Once you know that there are differences, right? Once you know that there are different elements in the periodic table, you might say, well, what are the characteristics that define those differences, right? And so we know, like, if we look at the periodic table, it's the number of protons and neutrons and electrons. But when you think about cells, it's not quite so easy. And so you might say, well, maybe it's the epigenetic state, which could mean accessible chromatin. It could be, you know, marks. It could be methylation. It could be TCR sequence. It could be specific proteins. And so we've always thought about sort of this, this first step of saying, like, what are the things? And then what are the things that differentiate them? So what are the identities? And then what are the characteristics? But a lot of what 
is critical in biology, or at least you know, from the human biology we like to study, is that these cells don't work in isolation, right? We are very different than 10 to the 14 cells just hanging out in a pond. You know, we have many different cell types that have these evolved social contracts where they're codependent upon one another. And we're different, you and me, but you know, we have roughly similar cells sitting in roughly similar places to a first approximation. So you have to start to think about you know, these things that you would think about in like the social sciences all the time. Well, how does where a cell sits influence, you know, its behaviors? And so we like to think about sort of those those environments, those sort of fluxes, like what is the milieu, um, which could in this case be like cytokines or chemokines or metabolites. And then we like to think about like, well, who do those cells talk to? You know, so much of what's important in immunology, for example, is conversations among cells, whether it's, you know, an antigen presenting cell activating a T cell or, you know, something along those lines. And so you might ask yourself, well, what are the interactions that exist? And, you know, in physics and chemistry, these are the coupling constants, you know, the way in which different things link to one another. And so it's very intuitive. And then you might say, well, now that you've started to think about like, you know, what are the pieces and what are the things that define them? And like, what do they sit in? And like, who are they talking to? The question really becomes, well, as you start to scale that out and you start to think about it, like, what is the integration of the synthesis of that? Like, how do you get communities? And like, what are the things that drive it? And then you start to say to yourself, well, when you look at it like this, and you recognize that there are things that are going to drive disease, can you begin to think about what it is that's going wrong? Is it like that you have too many of one particular cell type? Is there some sort of failed communication? Is um, you know one cell not doing its job and another cell is trying to moonlight, and so it's not doing its job as well? And so you know those are the sorts of questions we like to ask. And so you know, five steps, I, it's one way of thinking about it, but at least when I'm trying to describe to people like holistically, this is where our head's at, it works. But then there's so many places where you can be like, well, a technology that you're talking about, is it really this or this? Because, you know, you might say, well, where a cell is in space is a characteristic. But on the other hand, you could say it also tells you something about like who it interacts with. And so it gets fuzzy. But I think having, you know, some mushy frameworks or, you know, some sort of like lampposts are a good place for people to begin to say, oh, well, I kind of understand what you're talking about and like where you're engineering towards. Very interesting to me, at least, just to see it written out, you know, because I think a lot of us think about it, but we don't necessarily put it on paper. So I really like that. It's so hard to put on paper. You know, we spent so much time like sitting there going back and forth. Are these the right words? So this is the right way of doing it? Because you'd be like, here are the million and a half ways in which this falls apart. And at a certain point, you just have to be like, look, this is not perfect, but let's put it out there. Let's get feedback. Uh, let's see how people feel about the ideas that, and the way in which we're expressing them. And in the same way that, you know, you're doing science and getting feedback on the science you're doing, same idea here. You know, you put out like, this is the framework we're thinking about. And we keep on refining and trying to get to it. And some people, sometimes people will be like, hey, this is what we're thinking. And then, you know, um, you're like, oh, well, that's a much better way of thinking about it. I don't know why I did that. Or, you know, I like that concept of that word. Let's try and fold it in. I, I think it's it's all about the synthesis. But yeah, to put some ideas out there and, you know, be resilient and listen to people and hear what they have to say, even if it's not necessarily the greatest things about the way in which you're thinking about something to begin. Yeah, it's, it's really great. And you put a lot of thought into how you display your research. I have been a fan of your website since I saw it like a, a year ago. I, I think everyone should just go and look at it because you have put a lot of time into thinking about your approach to research, the way that you, you know, frame the different components. And also, I, I really enjoy the section on mentorship and diversity. Well, it's not just me. You know, we, we were very lucky. We got connected with Dirk and Sigrid at Size Stories. And, you know, they helped us to do a couple different things um, with graphics in the past. And then we were thinking about, like, how to, like, sort of describe our science and, like, put it out there and explain it. I think that one of the most important things about science is accessibility. I feel like if you can't explain what you're doing in a way in which somebody understands it, if you don't understand it that well, and I think, you know, many people like to sort of make science really hard so that um, they seem very smart. But when you deeply understand something, you should be able to explain it in a simple way. You should be able to explain the nuances, but you should be able to get a concept across. And I know that it's so hard because we're so trained to, you know, be very precise and not to let things be squishy. And I think that in a way that's been a problem during the pandemic when people have come for information because even my parents will ask me things and I'm like, well, you know, and I'm hedging and I'm saying these various things and they just want to know, you know, should I be double masking or what should I be doing? Or like, is it safe? And so it's pulled me maybe a little bit out of my comfort zone in some places, but I, I do think that making science accessible and making it so that people can understand what you're doing, give feedback, you know, give thoughts, get engaged is becomes critical to this entire thing we were talking about before this idea of doing stuff as a community, learning from sort of the collective expertise and knowledge of different people. And so we spent a lot of time on building pieces of the website and actually we're due for a refresh and about to start 
doing some new stuff now because you know, the lab has evolved. And when we started, we really were going to do some model system work. And all of a sudden, you know, we're doing a lot of cool work in infectious disease and cancer and various inflammatory conditions. And, you know, a lot of the things we've done relate to outreach and empowerment and some of the stuff that I've done with others through the Intel Atlas is really focused on aspects of that, you know, help to co-lead the equity group. And so, you know, there are new things we have to put up there. We have to do a better job of explaining, you know, who we work with around the world, of, you know, making space and championing their voices and sort of saying, this is the science that they're doing and it's great and like showing where they are. So, you know, we could do better with that. I think that tried to create a lot of resources, but we could do a much better job in making those accessible, putting educational content out. Um, I think when it comes to some of the pieces around diversity, equity, inclusion, I won't take credit for any of that. I mean, I obviously have tried to contribute, but a lot of it comes from the team who spent a lot of time engaging with these various things. And we've been very thoughtful about this. You know, we've been having a lot of ongoing discussions um, internally and externally, trying to figure out exactly what we value and why and thinking about what we want to be known for and what's important to us. And, you know, try to put some of that out. And, you know, we obviously have been inspired by a number of others and we try to give credit where credit is due and some of the things on our website. But I think that, you know, sort of normalizing discussions around some of these points and making it clear, like, here's how we're thinking about stuff and you know, listening to feedback and being resilient to challenges that may arise becomes important because we want a place where everybody thrives and where different ideas can come together and where you can collectively tackle problems from multiple different angles so that you make inroads faster and more effectively. I wish that more people spent more time thinking about some of these things. And, you know, I've just been told I'm a little crazy when it comes to figures, like exactly what colors need to be used and how it's done. And I'm like, well, what are you trying to show me with this? I do think it's critical. You have to think about how somebody on the other end is going to react to it. And it's nice when people say that they've enjoyed it. And I also enjoy when people are like, hey, I wish you had done a better job of this. And I'm like, oh, I wish I'd done a better job of that too. Yeah. So I'd really like to go into a little bit more depth about your path to science. And I, I know you mentioned you came from a math and theory background and physics and, and whatnot, but, but take me back a little bit further. Like, when did you know that you wanted to pursue science or math? And, and tell me a little bit about that journey. If I'm being honest, I never thought I was going to be a scientist. I always enjoyed sort of understanding how the things around me worked. I was always somebody who was a very curious kid. I liked taking things apart. I liked building things. You know, all the things where you would have said, oh, that, that dude's going to be you know, a scientist. But on the other hand, I was sort of interested in everything. I, you know, I loved history. I loved literature. I loved philosophy. I loved um, basically everything. And I'd say, you know, I was always involved in doing science, but it was never like, hey, this is my passion. It was just like, hey, I'm pretty good at this. And I sort of, you know, used it to try and think of this idea of how to be a little bit more balanced. And so I'd focus a little less on science so that I could try and work on the things that I wasn't as good at. You know, I think back to this really funny thing, and I always wonder whether it was the right thing to do or not, but where I changed my, you know, advisor in high school from somebody who was a math teacher to somebody who was an English teacher because I wasn't doing as well in English as I was in math. And I was like, well, you know, I need to like go interact with somebody that's going to help me do these various things. And so when I went to college, you know, I didn't sort of go with the idea that I was going to do science. I actually went to Columbia because I wanted this core curriculum, you know, this broad liberal arts education where I would take literature and art and music and you know, be in New York and go to a concert and be at the Met and sort of have this experience. Plus, you know, enjoying New York when I was, you know, young and dumb as opposed to old and dumb. But while I was doing it, I was taking all these science classes and I was enjoying it, but I sort of understood it. And like, it wasn't one of those things where I was like really going deep into it. And so I kept on doing stuff just some stuff started to grab my attention. And so um, I had done a little bit of work at Columbia when I was in high school. And so when I went in, you know, I sort of got to start in some advanced classes and start working my way up through physics. And I was like, well, you know, my father had been a physics major, told me that that's the science that smart people do. So I was like, oh, I'm going to go do this. And so I started doing it, started pushing my way through it, taking graduate classes in it. And it just wasn't anywhere near as fascinating as some of the things that I was doing over, you know, in like art. And like, I knew I wasn't going to be an artist, but, you know, I was really enjoying learning about it. I realized that, you know, some of the things that, that made me dissatisfied with what I was learning in physics is sort of the areas that I was studying. And so I started looking at some of the other stuff that was going on. Um, you know, at the time, Brian Greene had written The Elegant Universe and he was at Columbia. So I went and started looking at like string theory and math. And I was like, oh, this is great. Like I can push all the math. Like I understand how to do it. And differential geometry is really cool. And like, I, I understand all these things. Like I can think about these things I can do well in the class, but it was never one of those things that really just gelled where I was like, you know, this is what I'm meant to do with my life. And so I had also been sort of doing stuff in chemistry because it was part of the things you needed to do if you're going to be pre-med. You know, a lot of doctors in my family, I just figured that's what I'll end up doing. And I started taking these graduate classes in chemistry. And 
it was really strangely enough these classes on statistical thermodynamics and statistical mechanics that really caught my attention that really you know made me sort of interested in science and have you know, in retrospect been sort of what informs everything i've done since because those classes are really focused on how interactions among like individual atoms can work together to drive you know, macroscopic properties that we rely upon. And when you think about magnetism or what is temperature or what is pressure, those observables that you can see and how does like the physics that I've learned actually do something that I see in the real world. And like, all of a sudden I was like, aha, I get it. And so that's what I want to study. I wanted to understand how you go from something that, you know, is very fundamental to something that really, you know, you can understand. And I think in the biology research that I do, strangely enough, I've ended back in exactly the same spot where instead of thinking about like atoms and particles and how they drive some of these physical properties, like cells and how do those cells drive these tissue level properties? Because I can see and understand what happens when somebody gets sick. You understand this basic idea of dysbiosis and you can really get down to this like molecular precision of, oh, there's this mutation here. But then like, how does that mutation ramify through, you know, the activity of specific cells and which cells and how does that change the community and how does that actually result in what happens and it drives, you know, poor health or, you know, in some cases, maybe more robust health. And so I've sort of gone through that. And it was one of those things where the steps in between were very serendipitous and like how it ended up. But there was always this recurrent thread of trying to understand how these fundamental pieces, like, you know, really these building blocks came together to, to put stuff into the hole. And so... You know, I remember in my senior year applying to graduate school, applying to finance and consulting. And until the 25th hour, I was pretty sure that I was going to not be doing science. And then um, with a nudge from my parents and sort of a desire to explore stuff in my 20s, as opposed to, you know, trying to be a responsible adult or whatever that means, I ended up going to graduate school and you know, struggled in the beginning. I would say that you know, stuff was hard, particularly going from this like theory mindset to like trying to figure out how to get stuff done. Because like, a big difference between doing things in books versus you know actually trying to to create um and learned a lot of stuff along the way messed a lot of stuff up but got to a point where you know, stuff started working well and um, relied a lot upon the community to get the training i needed and you know tried to pay it back and so it's it's one of those things where it's been a it's been a very non-linear narrative that I couldn't have envisioned but i've always sort of been interested in these bigger concepts and i've been less worried about exactly how i do it Right? I'm sure that there are lots of different jobs that I could do um, where I could study sort of these basic principles. And that's really what I've been trying to focus on is like, what are the big things that will make me happy? What are the big questions I want to address? And you know, those microcosms manifest in like multiple different spots. And um, science is a great place to do it. It also lets me do sort of the education, empowerment, you know, community engagement, the kinds of things that I you know, wanted to do in medicine. It's just a different place. And so I'm incredibly happy with what I do and I, better than I could have ever imagined, but it's definitely not what I would have imagined at the beginning. As we wrap up the episode, a question that I usually end with is, what sorts of advice would you give to an early career scientist or someone entering just the field of systems biology or, or genetics or one of the many fields that you work in? Oh, it's so hard. I mean, I have so many nuggets of advice. Um, most of them are hard fought wisdom by um, messing stuff up along the way. I think the first thing that I'd say is, you know, follow your data. I mean, in a lot of places, like, I've really focused on what I've seen and trying to understand what it is. Like, you know, if I think back to like all the single cell stuff that I do now, I saw heterogeneity and rather than just assuming it was like a measurement error, I was like, what is going on here? Like, you know, what does this all mean? And it led me down this rabbit hole. Or, you know, thinking adjacently, like when I got into sort of doing immunology, because we were developing these little beds of nanowires that we could use to, you know, to record from neurons. The idea is that we want to study networks of neurons so we can study how the brain works. But in order to do that, you need a lot of electrical presence. So we wondered if we could make like these very, very small little needles using nanofabrication to sort of shove into cells and record electrical activity. And we found out that like it actually works. You know, the idea is acupuncture cell, acupuncture needles for cells, not lances. But when we did, you know, it was like, hey, what else could we do if we can poke a cell? And so that got me into like delivering perturbations, which got me into study, you know, immunology, getting back to this idea of like testing some of those correlations. So what it says, first off, follow your data. I think the second thing that I'd say is always think about sort of what you want to be known for and, you know, what kinds of things are important to you. I think in many places, you know, we focus on sort of tangibles like papers as opposed to like training or outcomes. What are the things that you personally want to develop for yourself? And what are the things that are going to make you feel as though it was a good use of your time and that you were successful? 
And I never promise people that are interested in joining the lab that, oh, you'll get all these papers that will just rain down and it will be fantastic. I'll say like, you know, really my goal is to figure out what you want to accomplish, figure out how to mentor you towards that and to work with you to get to where you want to be. And so I think that if you can sort of think of like going into science, this is an incredible opportunity to pursue something that you're passionate about and, and just sort of enjoy the experience and not get caught up in some of the you know, rivalries and complexities. Competition's good, you know, it drives innovation, all those sorts of things. But I really like the idea of collectively solving problems. And, you know, I recognize that I sell these things from a privileged position that's hard for many others to sort of view these things in, in a similar way. But it's still come back to this idea that you should really focus on making sure that you're doing things that develop you towards the person that you want to be and that solve the kinds of problems that you want. I think also there's too much emphasis on like exactly the right problem or exactly, you know, the right thing. You know, science is one of those lifelong journeys where you keep on sort of learning new skills and bring them in. And so, you know, maybe you learn how to do some fundamental work in one area and to write papers and to do grants. You don't want to overemphasize any piece. And the other thing I'd say is like, you only have one life to live. So don't get caught up in sort of these externalities of, oh, this is the system, this is how we have to do it. There's always this idea that, you know, if you decide you don't want to do graduate school, that you're failing or washing out. I don't think that's true. I think, you know, it takes a maturity to recognize that it might not be something that you want. And, you know, academia is great, but I've seen plenty of people go on to do biotech companies and do incredible things. I've seen people decide in the middle that they wanted to go to medical school and do great. I've seen people, you know, just sort of leave to go do all kinds of stuff. And so I don't think there's any one path towards success. I think it's really about taking the time and space to figure out, you know, what do you enjoy? Why do you enjoy it? And you know, how should you do it? And I'm not saying that, you know, you don't need a little bit of resilience and you don't have to work through hard things because science sucks. I mean, it's constant failure. I mean, if I think about it, it's sort of, I was describing this just the other day, it's like the majority of it is here. It's like you're at zero percent and everything's failing and then you get a little blip and like, it feels like this incredibly minor change. But on the other hand, it's like an infinity percent improvement. You went from nothing to something and then you know, getting up to a hundred is like so much easier because it's a small little jump. And so you have to, you know, sort of recognize that everything's always going to fail and it's always going to be problematic. But, um, you know, if you love it and you love the discovery since it's great, I also would say, you know, it's really important to, to collaborate with people and to sort of network within the community. Science is not like this like intellectual pursuit where you're supposed to be just by yourself working in this little room. And I know it works for some people, but like all the really good things that I've sort of seen in science or that I've been involved in have always involved like people coming together, tackling problems collectively, supporting one another, building community. And so making some of that a little bit more clear, like that there are different ways of doing things and that they're equally valuable and figuring out ways to sort of reward that are critical. There are plenty of people that will tell you how bad this, you know, co-first author thing is with a specific order as opposed to something that randomly shuffles and like highlighting that everybody can do it equivalently. I really liked a, a paper that came from, I think it was Gary Nolan's lab where you know, the order was uh, settled by a video game contest. So it was whoever won ended up in the first position um, of the co-first authors, but it's just one of those things that's so hard. I, you know, I'd say in the same way as, as many others would be like, think about the community that you want to be in and then think about how to be an active participant in trying to create it. And that involves outreach and engagement and in a lot of places like doing stuff for others and like just being a supportive individual. Like there's a ton of stuff that I've done that like has not yielded anything, but there are times where like I've done things that I didn't think were important at all, but they were meaningful to others and they've come back to be incredibly important and transformative. You know, I remember I helped somebody do something in graduate school that I wasn't sure it was the greatest idea, but they were, you know, I was like, I would love to help you because people would help me. A few years later, um, when I was interviewing for a grant, that person had left science, but was now working at a specific foundation and was on the other side of the table. And so when they were trying to figure out who they were going to fund, they were like, that guy's very smart and you should uh, support him. And that's led to you know, some incredible partnerships with people all around the world and a lot of funding. And so it's like one of those things where like, there are all these places where like, you know, you call it karma or call it whatever you want has, has come back and you never really know, but always err on the side of caution of being just a good dude. That's just the way I like to think about it. Like fundamentally, you know, just think about the community that you want to be part of and think about how you can go about making it as such. Well, thank you so much for joining me today, Alex. I had an excellent time talking with you. You dropped some incredible wisdom and yeah, I hope you have a great rest of your day. Well, I don't know about that, Chris, but it was my pleasure to be here. Thanks so much for having me and chatting with me.